12.30, let's go. I want to penalize you for being on time. Thanks for the crowd uh, online. It's good to have you. Uh, this is being recorded, so be aware of that. So if there's some nuggets here you want to share with someone someday, we'll provide the link. Uh, so just a couple introductory remarks. This is a, a data-driven agriculture uh, seminar, now webinar, also a series uh, on lots of different topics. Yeah, cursor in the right software, there we go. So we do have uh, a digital ag resources website. That's the link and there you can go to find announcements of upcoming seminars, webinars, links to all the previous recordings. They're archived on YouTube and other resources as well. There also is for those of you with interest in UAVs, a specific extension site on those. The upcoming webinars for 2022, here we are at the tail end of 2021. Uh, we're in the planning stage, actually. I'm supposed to do some reaching out yet this week. Uh, so we're going to be targeting Thursdays over half of a lunch hour plus a little bit. Uh, they will be in person in the Whistler building. We will record them, but they, we probably won't broadcast live. So if you want to see it live, be in person. Uh, we'll, we'll have an alternating focus. So every two weeks, we will have one. In one week, it will be an internal audience focus, like educating the faculty and staff and students of Purdue about those things. And then two weeks later, it will be an external audience uh, type of seminar or webinar. Of course, the Purdue people are also always invited, but the focus would then be taking Purdue insights and information and, and sharing it with the world. So it will be uh, alternating every two weeks, uh, starting in late January. So today we're in the hybrid format still. Uh, I wasn't quite sure how to do it. So I put the S slash W, it's a webinar. It's where we are today. So those of you that are online, we'd encourage you to use the chat feature. If you do use the chat feature to pose a question, please do not send it to the host, which is this presenting computer because we won't see it. So just pose the question to all and then uh, Randy Trida can help us relay the questions. So we'd prefer you keep your uh, self-muted and cameras off until the end, and then we can have some live Q&A as though you were here. Uh, so we'll do it both in person and online with some Q&A at the end. Uh, so uh, the topic today uh, and our presenter is Dr. Jason Lusk. You can see the title there. Uh, I probably could use most of the seminar time to introduce it, but I won't. I'll give the brief version. Uh, but Jason is uh, a distinguished professor of agricultural economics here at Purdue University. He is also the department head of a very uh, strong and uh, reputation department of ag economics here at Purdue. His education is in food technology and ag economics. He's the past president of the Ag and Applied Economics Association, is a fellow of the same organization. He is uh, certainly a prolific writer. Uh, well over 200 refereed journal articles to him and his graduate students. And lately, he's been turning out one book every two or two and a half years. Uh, so if you want to find those, you can go to jasonlusk.com and see uh, that he's also a very prolific and very practiced speaker. And I think uh, you'll get a sense of that today. So without uh, further ado, Jason, I'll switch it to your slides. Thank you so much uh, for presenting this uh, topic of uh, dice boards in food systems. Thanks, Dennis. Uh, thanks for everybody. I think given the, I've heard that word, webinar format, um, I'm going to restrict my range of mobility here, even, even though I don't really like to wander around a bit so that the folks on the other end can, can see. And I think I'm also, because everybody's seated pretty far away, going to take, take off this mask so that hopefully I can be heard uh, a little bit more clearly and, and without any risk to you all since you're sitting uh, 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 well more than six feet away from me. So Dennis, by the way, if you look at when I became department head and when my book productivity stopped, those things are very closely correlated. So uh, <laughs> something, something has to be on that front. Um, I had actually a bit of a difficult time deciding what to talk about. So Dennis, thanks for the invitation to speak here today. Um, you know, normally when I get asked to speak in a research seminar, I try to present something that's sort of on the frontier of the disciplinary knowledge in the field I'm working in. And so it would follow a, a traditional kind of paper format, you know, motivation about what's missing in the literature, a, uh, you know, hypothesis, uh, hypothesis testing, objectives, all that sort of thing. 
but this is not that kind of presentation. So rather, what, what I'm going to do is just talk to you a little bit about some of the work that I've been engaged in with some folks that I'll, I'll mention as we go along here. Really, it started as, as a response to some of the events going on with COVID, although we're sort of moving in, in different directions now. But I'm going to use COVID as, as the motivation to talk a bit about uh, why, why I got interested in, in this space. I, I should say, too, if you have any questions, you want to interrupt me, uh, don't hesitate to just uh, stop me and I can take them as, as we go. Of course, I can't see those of you on Zoom, so I, I can't see those questions. So, Randy, maybe if you get one, you can feel free to interrupt me. There too. Hey, Jason. See if we can move this forward. So hey, Jason. I don't hey, probably Jason, need to remind all of you of uh, you know the exact timelines of COVID, but I'm going to use this as a motivation for for some of the work that we're doing here. It was almost two years ago now, a year and a half ago when those first COVID shutdown started to happen. So even as early as early March, we started to see some headlines that consumers were stopping stocking up at the grocery store. And it was just you know very shortly after that that um, the really big shutdowns and disruptions happened. So we had two big economic shocks that happened at the same time. One, we had a, a big spike in demand for food uh, delivered through restaurant or through grocery stores, and then um, simultaneously a, a reduction or destruction of demand on food away from home from restaurants. And there's just a couple of examples. Some of those were because of uh, policy. So there's an example of California governor shutting down restaurants. But some of it was just you know individual choices of consumers you know worried about the virus and saying we're not going to eat out as much. And you all lived through that, so I don't have to show you pictures of the grocery store. But it, you know it created a lot of consternation. I'd say one of the number one questions I was getting is are, are we going to have enough food to eat? And if you look at some of the data that's out there. Um, you can see these were really historically really very large shocks to the food system. So I'm going to talk to you about some data dashboards. Actually, this website is a really cool data dashboard site. If some of you want to go to it, tracktherecovery.org. This is a website that's uh, mainly run by a professor at Harvard, Raj Shetty, and a big team of researchers. And they've found partners to collect data and make that data publicly available in ways it wasn't beforehand. So this particular example is credit card and debit card spending data. They got that data from a company that, that uh, does monitors transactions um, in, uh, in debit cards and credit cards. And of course they don't release all the details, but they've categorized spending into different categories here. So this is a dynamic website. If you go there, you can pick different, you can look at different states, you can pick different categories, but this particular example is spending on food and grocery on food away from home. And then the blue line in the middle is total spending in all categories. So you can see the big spike in restaurant, in a, I'm sorry, in grocery spending, the big dip in uh, restaurant spending. And then interestingly, actually, I just you know pulled this slide out a couple of days ago. We're actually spending about 20% more today than we were before the pandemic began, which is maybe surprising. Maybe it gets to another point I'm gonna talk about, which is we're paying more for food today too. So it's a combination of those two factors. So really big shocks to the system. Um, right after those sort of demand-driven shocks related to restaurants and grocery stores, then we had this big supply side shock that happened too because of the shutdowns that we had in the meatpacking sector. So in late April, early May, there started to be some uh, packing plant shutdowns. Workers in the plant got COVID uh, and you know this was disrupting the meat supply. So here's the uh, front page of the USA Today. This is the largest circulating paper in the country. And this doesn't happen to me often. So I'm going to, you know, in a little bit of self indulgence here, but I was quoted on the very front page of USA Today uh, saying that I didn't think the food system was breaking, but it was in real critical condition uh, at, that, at that moment. That was partially in response to the fact that the CEO of Tyson ran a full page ad in the New York Times saying that the food system was breaking. Um, so you know, part of that's just to illustrate some of the dynamics of the shocks. And maybe as a way, way to segue to some of the things we were thinking about at this time is, you know, why was that happening? Why, why would the shutdown of a few meat packing plants matter? Um, this gives you a sense of the level of concentration uh, in the meat packing sector. So those 10 blue dots are the 10 largest beef packing plants. The red ones are the 15 largest pork packing plants. And, and combined, those two, those plants process about 60% of all cattle and hogs in this country. 
So, you know, just one of them shuts down. So, you know, take that plant in North Carolina, that hog plant's the biggest one. That's about six to 7% of total national processing capacity. So that's big enough to have, you know, aggregate nationwide impacts if it goes down. Um, it's not necessarily a bad thing. So these plants are really efficient and they're really big. And so that normally means it makes our food more affordable than it would be otherwise. It makes actually cattle hog prices higher than they would be otherwise because there's not this extra cost in the system. But in times like we just lived through, it can have some consequences where you know we get two or three, four of these shut down, you get some real adverse consequences. So uh, Indiana, you can see we have two of the largest pork plants, uh, Tyson and Indiana Packers. They were both closed at about the same time in May of last year. And this just gives you a sense of what was going on. So this is just daily processing numbers for cattle, hogs, and chickens. For whatever reasons, chickens during this period weren't nearly as effective. That's a whole different top, top, uh, talk and topic on its own. But at the worst of it, which was about May 1st, uh, we were processing about 40% fewer cattle and hogs than the same time the previous, previous year. Um, that affected prices. So uh, here's uh, what they call the beef price, price spread. So this is just the difference between the wholesale price of beef that that uh, you know grocery stores or restaurants are paying to buy their beef and the price that farmers ranchers are receiving for cattle so that gap is always a source of a lot of controversy um, but you see the little spike that happened because one plant shut down in kansas back in 2019 that created such fervor that uh, you know there were several congressional hearings i testified before the u.s senate right after that first spike and I say that to say, look how big the COVID spike was compared to that. So you can only imagine there's been multiple congressional hearings and lawsuits and whatever else after this. Um, and so at my point showing you all these is just to say that, you know, there are a lot of dynamics, people trying to understand what's happening out there. Um, it, but the impacts were big and, and controversial. And I should say they haven't gone away. So if I fast forward to roughly today, like here are the headlines just a few weeks ago from the New York Times uh, asking whether this Thanksgiving was gonna be our most expensive ever. And uh, again, a little more self-indulgence, but this was probably uh, one of my favorite uh, quotes of my own, or a quote about me is a reporter in the Atlantic started his story by saying that my Thanksgiving tradition was answering journalists' stories about rising food prices. Um, but you know, it was really, I think the number of stories and uh, requests about what was happening at food prices is certainly on a level I haven't seen in my 25 or year, year or so career. Um, so that's really the backdrop. A lot of uh, fluid dynamics happening. It relates to geography, where plants are located. It relates to prices. In the, at least in, the, in so far, a lot of it has related to COVID. Um, that's just more food prices. And so I think in ways I probably haven't appreciated before, I, you know, I think, you know, began to think there's just, you know, much more need for more timely data about our food system. There is a lot of timely data that exists, but often it's not in forms that are easily accessible or understood by journalists or the public. And so, you know, for example, the, those cattle slaughter numbers that I, I showed you before, those numbers are released every day by the USDA Ag Marketing Service but it's in an arcane looking text file and you gotta get, know where to go get it on the website. It doesn't make sense unless you're an expert working in this field. And so you know, there's both, I think, a need to bring new data to bear on some of these questions and then take data that's already being collected and put it in a form that's easier for people to digest. And then combining data in ways that maybe people haven't before to, to create some new insights. Another way I think to think about what we're doing here, I took this from Jin Ho the other day. So uh, Jin Ho's a postdoc working with the Center for Food Demand Analysis that we, we've kicked off. And we were talking about what are we trying to accomplish with this, with this project? And one thought here is, you know, we're trying to democratize data here a bit. You know, if you're a credit card company or you are, uh, own a big CPG consumer package good brand, you know a lot about what's happening. You have access to a lot of private data that other people don't. But if you're just a food consumer or you're a farmer, you probably don't know nearly as much about what's, what's happening. And so I think one way I think about what we're trying to do is bring data about what consumers are thinking to farmers and then bring data about, you know, maybe eventually about, you know, what's happening at the farm level to, to consumers. So that's, that's my motivation. And so I'm going to show you several examples of things we've been working on over the course of the last year or so. And one of the first ones was just some conversations that started initially about how do we even think about calculating and illustrating 
potential vulnerabilities. So in, the, in those very early stages of those COVID, COVID shutdowns, um, uh, Dean Plout put me in connection, in, in a, she connected me with uh, Ranveer Chandra, who's one of the, the chief scientists at Microsoft. And we were just brainstorming about what could we do to help provide information. And I don't, you know, you've all been involved in research projects. It's hard to know where the idea comes from, but this, these ideas came out of a series of conversations we were having. Um, so we were talking about, let's put some dashboards available to the public. The questions people were asking is, are we gonna have enough food to eat? My sort of gut instinct was, yeah, it's not, the food is not the problem. The food is, is are we gonna be able to get it to the people? But we also wanted to illustrate that, you know, that the problem wasn't necessarily in, in food production. So where were the vulnerabilities? And my sense is even before the packing plant, plant shutdowns was those vulnerabilities were probably gonna be where the labor was. If people got sick and weren't able to work, um, but then those rest, it's not just labor, but it's where's the labor in relation to the types of food being produced. So just as maybe an uh, illustrative example is, you know, uh, you know, if you take a different particular food, there's a lot of geographic heterogeneity in terms of where that food is produced or at least the ag commodity. So take uh, beef cows, for example, they're spread pretty much all over the United States, which is very different than say uh, potatoes, which are mainly grown in Idaho and you got a little bit of production in Michigan as well. So it matters a lot if you think about where COVID is happening, you know, where it's happening. If you get a big COVID outbreak in that little stretch of Idaho, you might have a problem with potato production or harvest, for example. But maybe not so much with, say, broilers and chickens, because we don't grow. That's not what, what we produce in that region. So we need information about geography of production, but also ge geography of, of workers. So I think what we started thinking is let's, let's marry these data together. We, we have a sense, at least, of where different commodities are grown. So here's a graph, again, on the top left of vegetable production. Um, we know where the farms are, also from USDA data. And because of outlets like New York Times or Johns Hopkins, they were producing real-time data on where the COVID cases are. So with just some simple algebra, we could put those things together and make an estimate of how much of that vegetable production might be at risk. Now I should acknowledge the one thing we, we haven't really incorporated, which does matter a lot for uh, ag production is time, right? Is it during harvest season or planting season? We're, we're kind of ignoring that um, because well, we just are, but I'd say it's a weakness of what we're doing here. So some problems, even with this dashboard, this would be true of all the ones I'm gonna to talk to you about. But uh, one is, uh, first of all, no entity that I'm aware of is tracking COVID cases by occupation. So if you wanna know, there have been a few select reports, like there've been some estimates of how many COVID cases happen among meatpacking workers. Um, but just in general, if you wanted to know like how many farmers have had COVID, no, nobody's tracking that data. Um, so that's a problem. So that's something we're going to have to estimate or infer. The other one is this, this was actually it's not an area I worked in a lot before, but there's actually no perfect data set on numbers of agricultural workers in, say, a county. There are different measures. Each have their own strengths and weaknesses, um, but, uh, but nothing is perfect. Um, and I'll talk about the one we use in a minute. Um, also, we don't, even if you know the number of, say, agricultural producers, what we might think about as a farmer in a county, you don't always know, well, what, what is that particular producer planting this year, for example? So, you, you know, there's no data set that would allocate those workers to different crops. And then, of course, the thing that I'm ignoring, the seasonality here. But so what, what can we do, though? We, we, did, we did the best we can. And one, the first step was, can we make an estimate at a county level of the number of ag workers that have COVID? And so it, uh, this is a very simple calculation. So we, we go... Uh, we have you know, the number of cases, reported cases or deaths in a county, and that gets updated daily. The data we use comes from Johns Hopkins. Um, so we, we know in a county, say Tippecanoe, how many people have COVID. What we also know, or we can make inferences from, is what is the share of people in, say, Tippecanoe County that farm? And as long as we assume those... Uh, you know, COVID cases are evenly distributed among different occupations, which is an assumption that could be wrong. We can make, it, make an estimate of what share of, uh, or you know, if we know the share of employers in a county, or employees in a county, or workers in a county that are farmers. If we know the number of COVID cases, we can make an estimate then of the number of people farmers that have COVID in a county. 
And then, of course, we can sum that up over counties and get a state level estimate or a US level estimate. And so that's, that's all we do. So 2017 is the data we use for the census of ag because the last time the census of ag was done, they have several measures of agricultural workers. The, the one we focused on initially was um, they asked a question of they have a category called an agricultural producer. I think that's what most of us would think about as farmer. The, their definition is do you have managerial decision making on the farm? Like, do you is the criteria they use? They have another category that says, are you a hired worker? Or how, how many numbers of hired workers are there? So we, in the first iteration of this dashboard, we just summed those two things together because there's not a lot of overlap between them. Although you can imagine some hired workers that are managers and have managerial decision-making. Um, and then later and some other future iterations, we use other categories too. They have unpaid labor. So think about kids, for example, spouses, that would be another example. Uh, and then they have migrant workers. The problem with migrant workers is uh, some migrant workers are in the category of paid labor and some migrant workers are in a category of all its own uh, contract labor. So uh, if we just added together migrant workers and uh, hired labor, we would be double counting. We don't know by how much, but we know we would. So, uh, so we don't ever add that category to some others. So if I know the number, if I have an estimate then of the number of ag workers that have COVID in a county, then I can also make an estimate of what, um, how much production might be at risk because uh, I could basically calculate productivity of labor. How much output is produced for each worker? And if I know one of those workers has COVID, I'm gonna, that's the amount of production that's sort of at risk because of a, of a worker illness. Um, so we, we initially called this lost productivity. I don't really like that word. We, it wasn't actually lost. I just call it vulnerable uh, productivity because uh, maybe it was lost, maybe it wasn't. Um, were you going to ask a question, John, or just stretching? Yes, All right, good. Um, so that's that. So that this was the very initial version of, of what we called the, the uh, Purdue uh, Food and Agricultural Vulnerability Index. It's really, I think, better described as a farm vulnerability index, farm worker vulnerability index would be a better way to describe it. And so, you know, the map would show, you know, in, in different states, um, you know, the number of ag workers that we estimated to have COVID. And then we were calculating, we just picked a few commodities and calculated the share of that production of that commodity we thought was at risk because of, of you know, workers having COVID. And I'm not going to walk through all the steps of this tool, but what I will say is a couple of things. One, this this dashboard was largely created, all those calculations were mine, but this dashboard was created by the engineers at Microsoft. So uh, uh, Ranveer connected me with some of the people he had there. Um, um, uh, Hope, I'm forgetting her last name, I have it on a slide here in a minute. She's the one that did a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of how this worked. Um, but, you know, I thought well, we could, you know, it, this tool, this dashboard is, uh, so some of you are probably familiar with Tableau or something like that. So Microsoft's version of that is called Power BI. And it turns out to be fairly user-friendly. And we thought, well, if we could do this, we could do lots of, lots of other things. The other thing I noticed is I thought people, this came out in the summer after all those initial disruptions, I thought people were gonna be really uh, interested in this share of farm production that's at risk. So the, the slide you can see here, this is for dry beans. You can see it's a tiny, and I don't remember when this screenshot was taken, but you can see at that time we were estimating like less than a percent of dry bean production was at, was at risk, which was consistent with my sort of intuition that production wasn't what's at risk here. Um, so, but the media and other people basically ignored this number, although I did get calls from, actually I had some calls with uh, uh, Homeland Security, uh, US, you know, several offices in the USDA that were trying to use some of these numbers. Um, but the number that really captured the media's attention was number of farm workers that had COVID. And in particular, people wanted this estimate of number of migrant workers that had COVID. So this, I was getting calls from New York, you know, basically every major media outlet you could think of. And that what they would always ask me is how many farmers have COVID? How many migrant workers have COVID? I think they're really interested in sort of vulnerable populations. So what we did over time is up, update this tool um, to provide those estimates of different types of workers that have COVID. Um, and you know, just to 
give you a sense of, you know, things are frustrating when you develop these tools. Uh, and that is like, we didn't update the threshold parameters on when a state turns red. So every, after some period, like every state was red. <laughs> so there's no, no differentiation at all. And then I realized like, oh, I'm gonna have to learn how to, or get some people around here that can work, you know, and, and manipulate some of these, these dashboards. The other interesting thing you could do in this dashboard, uh, and there's a link to where you can go to it there, uh, is you can drill into a county level view, for example. And one of the things I thought was interesting here is Indiana. Again, I can't recall exactly when this screenshot was taken, but if you would have taken this screenshot in May, uh, in, I'm sorry, yeah, May, say May of 2020, when all those packing plants were shut down, the red dots in Indiana were squarely around the, the uh, in the counties where Tyson and, uh, and where the Indiana Packers were. Now, we're not measuring packing plant workers. These are estimates of farm workers, but it just goes to show that that was a, a big enough event. It was showing up in our, in our data at the same time. Um, so one of the things I did you know, last summer is I thought, okay, let's, let's turn this into an academic paper. So we kind of took this snapshot in time of March, 2021. So roughly a year through the, through the pandemic, um, you know, took what was in the dashboard and sort of, uh, you know, enshrined it, I guess, in an academic paper. So at that time, here are our estimates of the number of these four categories of workers that had COVID. And then we also extended that to our estimates of deaths. And then you can see sort of the, our, our estimate incidence rate, like what, what share of that population is that. We uh, did some other things in this paper. Um, for example, like one of the things we calculated is if you live in a county that tends to have a lot of farm workers, those counties also tend to have higher COVID incidence rates. I don't even really think about why. I'm just saying this is what the, you know, maybe it's just correlation and not causation. But if that was a little counterintuitive to me because I would assume if you're in a rural area, maybe COVID wouldn't spread quite as much. But at least according to these data, at this time we did this, counties that had more ag workers tended to have higher incidence rates than, than those that, that had fewer. Um, the other way you can go about this, and we actually did this later, is rather than trying to calculate the bushels of beans that are potentially at risk, we thought, why don't we just make this about dollars at risk? And so actually the USDA has a, a, a series that it updates about every four years on agricultural productivity. And all productivity is they take all outputs and they divide it by all inputs and see how that changes over time. And if you can get more output with the same number of inputs, that's an increase in productivity. One of their inputs is labor. So I can take our estimates of the number of workers that have COVID and sort of subtract that from the labor and get an estimate of how that affects sort of aggregate uh, from output. And so, you know, our, my, our estimate based on that first full year throughout all this was maybe, you know, a potential loss of like 300 million um, in ag output. To give you some sense of scale, you know, uh, we, it's about four or 500 billion in, ag, in, in total ag sales every year. So it's a small share of that total, but, you know, 300 million isn't nothing. I would take it if somebody gave it to me. Um, so, you know, as I said, we're, we're calculating these farmer, you know, estimates of farmer cases every day because we have the COVID data every day. So we can plot them and they, they tend to follow. So the black line here is the total population, like every person in the population. The other lines are the different categories of workers. You know, they kind of look like they follow the same trend. So you might think, OK, is this dashboard even needed? Why don't you just pay attention to where COVID cases are? That's all you need to know. And I would say. Um, it just depends. So if I take that time period, that one year time period, I just look at the correlation across the counties um, um, in COVID cases amongst the general population and COVID cases that we estimate among farm workers. You know, it's often close to one, but there's a lot of times where it's actually close to negative one. So there are times when for whatever reason, COVID was moving through rural populations at a very different rate than it was moving through the general population. Um, again, I don't, I'm not an epidemiologist. I don't know why or how that happens. I'm just showing you that what the data says in terms of, of what happened. And then of course we can map where those things are happening. So if you're you know, migrant workers, where were those cases at? You know, here's, our, here's our map estimate of where those migrant worker cases were happening as of March 31st. Through, throughout the whole year, 
of COVID, that first year of COVID, essentially. And, you know, not, it's not surprising. It's where the migrant workers are <laughs> in general. So Florida, Southern California, a little bit of Texas, uh, by and large. I think I already said that. So um, what's on this slide? I think this is this is the newer version. So Diane Berg in, um, is in Ag IT in the college. She helped me sort of convert the tool to this, which we took away all the production at risk stuff and just have categories of the different kinds of, of workers, all workers, the producers, the migrant workers. And you can still drill into any one of these at the county, county if you want to. Maybe in a minute, I'll get off my PowerPoint. We can look at some of these dashboards in sort of real time. So, um, you know, that was the first foray into this. Um, the interesting thing, though, is I think most of the disruptions we've seen, for example, in the meatpacking sector, that those were not farmers. So really, you know, what I had been thinking all along is, can we do something like this for the food processing sector? Because that's where labor is going to be more densely populated, probably. You're going to have a lot more workers at the same spot. And also, if you think about um, the uh, food processing sector, you know, that it's, it's where a lot of that, those commodity, ag commodities go, and then, you know, they get concentrated in a smaller number of companies before coming back out to consumers. And so that's where there could be more, more vulnerability. So basically, we just do the same calculation, um, except we got to use di slightly different data. So there are a couple of different data sets on um, where workers in food processing, the food processing sector are in different food processing sectors and in different locations. So there's a company called, uh, I think it's called uh, Econometric Analysis, I believe, but yeah, EMSI, and the Bureau of Economic Analysis also has some data on that. So Ahmad Wada is a, also a postdoc. He's working with the Food Demand Center. He, he really is the driving force behind making this, this dashboard happen. And again, we can, we can do the same kind of calculation at, okay, how much production is at risk? But in this case, it's in dollars because we know the output from that sector in that county, at least as of 2019. So assuming that hasn't, hasn't changed a lot. So again, it's not actually, we're not calculating production that didn't happen. We're just calculating production that could be at risk because we know workers are, you know, have cases in, the, in those counties. So that, that's this dashboard and, and largely it does something similar, but um, what this dashboard does is again focus on food processing. Maybe I'll play around with this one so you can we can sort of talk about it for a minute. So uh, this is our our at least temporary website for the moment uh, for our, our Center for Food Demand Analysis, and we're we're adding more dashboards and all of these. But uh, for now, we have uh, I believe four of them. Um, So yeah, what, what's here? So over on the left-hand side, um, there are different food industry categories. So we could click whatever we want, let's say uh, dairy. And it'll show us a US map of where people working in dairy processing have COVID, or, or our estimates of, of where they are. And maybe not surprisingly, it's where a lot of dairy processing occurs, right? California, um, Wisconsin, New York State. Um, so it, you know, that's that. So this tells us down here, the expected number of workers in this industry that, that have had COVID over the last year. So 15,000 people that work in, in dairy. So this is not the farm dairy, this is the dairy where they're pasteurizing, homogenizing and pack, packaging the milk. That, it's that sector of the economy. Um, this is the estimate of how many in the last 30 days. And the bottom numbers here are just give some perspective, like across the entire country, these are the number of jobs in this industry. So if you look at these two, it's roughly one, you know, one tenth of all, uh, you know, of, of all workers in this industry, we were estimated to have had COVID during this, this time period. This box up here is probably too small for you to see, but this shows you the county by county, like the, this estimate of our vulnerable production in dollars. So it actually sorts it by the highest magnitude. So uh, Franklin, Ohio, I don't know where that is. Um, um, Tulare, California, that makes some sense. Probably a lot of dairy production there. You know, you wanna look at something different, like say animal slaughtering, you do that too. And of course the numbers, numbers look a little different. So uh, again, similar purpose as the last dashboard I showed you just um, um, 
uh, focus on food processing. So again, I think these are screenshots here. Uh, this one is bakeries and tortilla manufacturing. And then um, again, you can zoom into any state. I didn't do that when we were there before. So we can look in Indiana and say, you know, a bakery and tortilla manufacturing in Indiana, what are the states where there's the most, so it's not just the most production, but it's the most production relative to the number of workers we're estimating to have had COVID in that sector. And um, Marion, Laporte, Vanderburg, those are the counties in Indiana that, that we, you know, would, would want to pay attention to if we were trying to sort of think about vulnerabilities there. Yeah, John? That's a loss of productivity there. Cash value. Right? Yeah, yeah. So it's not the total production, but it's the production sort of. Uh, it's a, we, what we do is we take the output per worker, and then we multiply it times the number of workers that have COVID. Yeah. Do you think any of those losses have been offset by inflated prices for <laughs> product? Yeah, sure. So that's the problem we have here is you know these are all the dollars are all 2019 data. So that, you know, there's nothing in here that's actually because actually we don't know. Nobody is calculating, you know, in Vanderburg, Indiana, bakery production in close to real time. So sure, yeah, that's right. So you you know, there's the real time changes that are happening. So in in lieu of that, that's what these estimates are trying to do is give you some sense of whether it could be some vulnerability, even though the actual economic impact is something different for sure. So you know, I don't like I said, I've got some sense. That, that these tools may be used in that way. I don't know, but the thought is if you're a policymaker, you're in a state department of health, this gives you some sense of where to look right? if you're worried about you know, a sector or, or vulnerability. So, I mean, as we were kind of going along and as I was talking to Ahmad about these things, um, you know, I thought, well, we, we have these data and ho hopefully we won't always be talking about COVID. But there's still, I think, a need for people to understand our food system a little better and vulnerabilities more generally beyond just COVID. So um, it, actually, Ahmad had this idea, but maybe it's, maybe before you even back that up, um, just to give you a sense of some of that demand for food system information, you know, in you know May, June of 2020, the college was getting a lot of inquiries about why are, why are we potentially going to euthanize hogs, <laughs> um, and uh, you know, you know, why are we dumping milk at the same time there's no milk in the grocery store? So just like a lack of, you know, sort of understanding why this is happening. So our, our great, you know, friends in the AgCom created this graphic and uh, Candace Curley and, and I helped write some text around just describing the food system. But I think this graphic, and I don't have the version of this that moves, but it's actually animated. But they did a fantastic job with this. And I think it illustrates what a lot of people don't understand about the food system, that there's a lot of farmers, a lot of retail outlets, but a lot of that food flows through a very small number of choke points. And so trying to help people understand that in situations like this, I think is kind of critical. So one of the things that Ahmad noticed is he said, well, I was using this data to do the calculations and sort of vulnerabilities to COVID. Why don't we just you know, take this data set and make it you know, so people can just try to understand the food system more broadly. And so again, this, this dashboard has nothing to do with COVID. It's just simply, where does food processing happen? Uh, and how much sort of value added is there in different locations? This one doesn't go down to the county level. The county level data is a little sketchier, um, it's not as detailed. So this is really at the state level. But what this lets you do is, you know, those same categories over the left, I think it's about eight or nine of those. You can click on one. This slide right here is on grain and oilseed uh, manufacturing. And so this, what this will show you is you know, where, where in the country is there the most you know, grain, grain and oilseed manufacturing happening? You can see it's uh, you know, in the states of the darkest color there, Indiana, Illinois. And uh, what is that state there? I can't see very well. Uh, Iowa, I guess. Um, so that, you know, that's where that activity occurs. And uh, you know, it gives you a sense at the bottom here, total revenue in that industry across all the United States is about $80 billion in 2019 dollars. So to your question, John, no, uh, not, not calculating our current inflationary uh, impacts. Um, but the other things we can calculate are you know, some inputs things. So about 3 billion in this sector is being paid on payroll. So workers of all stripes, all the way probably from, um, you know, entry level to executives uh, are getting paid about 3 billion. Um, 
The cost of materials is about $58 billion. So that's probably buying the soybeans before they turn them into soybean oil um, or uh, you know, whatever else is going on in the sector. And then you know, expenditures on capital. So this, this sort of gives you a, a sense of the share of where all those costs go, how much of it is in the raw farm ingredients versus labor versus capital. Um, this you know, just tells you the number of employees in that sector, how many of those employees are production versus kind of management workers. And then again, sort of states, uh, you know, that are highest, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, as I mentioned before. So, you know, you can click on a different uh, state or you can drill into Indiana here. So, you know, I click on any Indiana and this just kind of shows so, so you of that total, Indiana is about 7 billion out of that 30, 30 billion, for example. So there's not any analysis or math going on here. This is just taking a data set and illustrating it and making it so people can kind of play, play around with it a bit. Um, again, this, this next one is really uh, uh, due to Ahmad. Uh, uh, you know, this was his idea. He'd been playing around with these data sets as we were talking about those dashboards. And Ahmad said, you know, some of these data sets, you can actually see, I can see how much is being, uh, how much output is pre being produced. And I can see uh, the input categories they're buying from. Can we use those data to infer like, okay, what, how vulnerable a particular industry in a location may be to a disruption of one of its input categories? So um, one way to think about this is take, take, you know, like bakery production in Indiana. So location A is, is Indiana. We can see how much of that industry in that state, at least, um, how much of its inputs are coming from a bunch of different categories like wholesaling, trucking, management, how much is coming from crops, livestock, uh, chemical manufacturing, plastics, all this kind of stuff. So there's, there's this, you know, data sets that, that have these things. So you know, while we don't really know whether that's risky or vulnerable or not, what we can do is compare it to, say, a bakery, not in Indiana, but in Illinois. And so how, of a, that same industry in another state, how much of its inputs are coming from wholesaling versus trucking versus, you know, so forth and so on, and compare them. And so we were trying to think about how can we think about whether an industry may be vulnerable to a disruption of one of its input suppliers. Um, there's a variety of ways to do this, but um, one way we do it in a, in a paper we, we've got uh, going is a, a diversity index. So if we just take the share of inputs from all these categories and you square it, um, you, that is a something called a Simpson diversity index. So the nice thing about it is you can scale it from zero to one. So if it's a one, all your inputs are like evenly coming from all your input providers. Whereas if you have a, a score of zero, it means you're buying all your inputs from one source. So you, it, and we kind of interpret that, that to mean you're really vulnerable to a disruption in that source of, of suppliers. So we can calculate this for all those output industries that I showed you on the previous graph. So just to give you an example, here's the animal slaughter. By the way, these categories are like US government categories. We didn't, we didn't create them. So in the animal slaughtering industry of, of all of its inputs, where it buys inputs from, you know, on average, I can't see, but it's like diversity index across all the states. It's you know, something around, um, you know, 0.6 on that zero to one scale. And, you know, it's, it's not, while it's pretty similar across the United States, there are some differences in different states. So you might say like, for whatever reason, Illinois' diversity index is a little uh, worse than, uh, than Indiana's. But it does differ across industry. So, you know, just to give you a sense, it's the same, the color pattern is still the same here, but this would be for the grain and oilseed milling industry. So I don't know what's going on in New Mexico, but they have a, a greater diversity of its inputs in, the, in New Mexico in this industry than they do in other states. Uh, so again, I think that we just think about this as you know, nothing definitive. Maybe there's a good reason why New Mexico you know, grain oil sick billing has more diversity among its input suppliers. But if you're a policymaker, you're working in grain uh, oil city, you might ask why. What is it about them that makes them different? Or it might give you a signal that whatever is going on in uh, Vermont and Maine, you want, might want to you know, check out because they're, they're different. They're relying more on a particular input sector. And it, it's just a signal of where you might want to focus some attention if you're going to focus on, on vulnerabilities. 
Um, yeah. Uh, you describing reminds me a little bit about economic input output, uh, economic oh, input output life cycle assessment. And I wonder yes. if you can maybe speak to the potential overlaps. Yeah, the, these are input output data. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so we're just taking input output data and saying, what what more can we do with this yeah. that hasn't been done as much in the past, or view it through the lens of vulnerability. Um, I'm not as familiar with how input these input output data are used in life cycle analyses. Um, so you could probably teach me more about that. I'd be, I'd be like to learn about that. But yes, this is just input output analysis, sort of you know, reimagined a little bit in terms of its use. And Ahmad, Ahmad's done a bunch of work here. So we've got a whole paper here about um, uh, so that one bad thing about that diversity index, it doesn't tell you which industry you're most vulnerable to, to. So Ahmad has created a bunch of measures that give you a sense of, okay, if you're in this industry, in this location, which input sector is it that you're you're most vulnerable to? And he has some measures for that. But I'm a little bit worried though that, you know, so we've sent this paper out for review. You know, I'm not, I'm not a, uh, um, you know, a lot of people that use these data are, you know, um, so regional analysis, this is not my main area of study. I'm a little bit afraid some reviewer is going to say, like, this is so obvious. Like, you know, like, of course you can use these input yeah. output data to say this. But yeah. Mark? Do you think that there's a sector participants or organizations of those that would use this uh, to their benefit and say, uh, it looks like the farmer, the producer, the zero ground zero person is getting, I told you, not enough profit from what is being produced here. And, It'll show that percentage, but it'll also help the processors to be able to say, look, I got a lot more costs than just your product. Yeah. You know, so it seems like a lot of conversations have been started in our uh, commodity order. Yes. So I won't mention any names, but I talked to an individual that uh, works for a, a major uh, buyer of agricultural commodities. They're in the, the restaurant industry. And um, he had seen some of these dashboards we had been putting out. And one of his questions was, this was back uh, several months ago when there was talks about, uh, it was like, how can I apply this to other things I'm worried about? So at that time, there's a lot of discussion of ra raising the federal minimum wage. So he was saying, I can overlay, I, I should be overlaying my production facilities with what the actual wages are relative, you know, to give me a sense of where my costs may come from. And as you said, you could use this information for whatever you want. You know, maybe their decision is we're going to shift production somewhere over here, you know. What have you? But yeah, I, I you know, I don't. Uh, there are probably ways this information maybe that I actually hope get used in ways I'm not thinking of. So I, I, again, I think part of this is sort of just a mission of making data more accessible, and then how people use it. Maybe I'm, I'm hopeful, maybe in ways we're not thinking about. Well, it's a good one. It was one of your math-related area that makes you think of that. Yeah. The dairy producer they say, well, this is evidence that we're not getting paid enough in the federal policies, but the, the math is exactly the same as where the processing is. Yeah, yeah. So it's hard to sort out in my mind. It is. Uh, there are estimates, you, there are estimates at the federal level by commodity of say farmer share of the retail dollar. None of that exists at say state local levels. One, one could create those um, if you, uh, do some of the stuff Jen Ho is working on now and come up with location specific prices, which don't don't really exist at the moment in any public publicly available way. Okay. So um, this is too much, too many. Uh, this is what I tell all my grad students never <laughs> to do um, with the slide. But to your to the question you asked, this is base, basically a, a re manipulation of an input output table, and you can think about it. It's like if there was a say a ten foot lot, ten percent loss in a particular input category, what would it do to the outputs um, in another category? And so, um, you know, without belaboring the point, and one of the biggest numbers there is in the animal slaughtering and processing, and the input category is in labor. So I, I think, you know, it does suggest that animal process disruptions to labor were always going to be a problem to animal production these data are before COVID, but you know, one could have potentially looked at this and said, "Where, you know, where's the vulnerability here?" Like, you know, that biggest big number right there, like thirty-nine, uh, you know, million dollars. That's one. Somebody said, "There's, there's, that's going to be an issue, <laughs> perhaps, if something happens to labor." Um, and so, one of the things again, this is Ahmad's doing. 
he took, uh, he basically took that paper and said, can I make a dashboard about it? Which I wasn't even thinking about. Um, and so uh, that's what this dashboard is. And I, I won't spend a lot of time about it, but what, what this dashboard allows you to do is pick an industry and pick a state. Um, the one I've got highlighted here are bakeries. Um, this is actually nationwide bakeries. So nationwide, about $31 billion produced by bakeries. Uh, about $8 billion of that is because of labor inputs. Another $22 billion is because of other inputs. And then the thing on the right shows you sort of where, where those inputs are coming from. And then our sort of uh, Simpson diversity index is up there. It's like 0.93. So you would say bakeries don't look like an industry that's, you know, they've got, they're buying inputs from lots of different sectors. Now they, they may still be disrupted if one of them shuts down. This doesn't tell you how like critically important it is, if, you know, but it does tell you they at least buy from lots of different industries. So maybe, maybe they got to worry about a lot of industries rather than just one. Um, and then you could you could drill in if you one wanted to on a particular state. So here's Indiana bakery that looks you know slightly different than the country, although although somewhat similar. Um, lastly, and I, I just want to end with a couple of comments here is, you know, I mentioned the comments about inflation. So right now, uh, uh, Anna, who works on our team as well, has been working with Ahmad and I to develop uh, a, a website talking about food price inflation. So these data, actually, we're not doing any math here. This is just taking government data and trying to make it more visually accessible and appealing. Now, we may do some math in, in uh, another iteration of this, but this is you know, literally taking the data that goes into the calculation of CPI, Consumer Price Index, creating a dashboard that will auto, you know, using APIs, will auto pull it in and update it every month. Um, but then, you, you know, I guess we are doing some math here, simple algebra based on those data that calculates. This one is uh, month to month price changes, uh, and you can click on different food categories, so either food at home or I've got the two I've got here are food at home and meats. And uh, if I if this was active, actually this we don't yet have this dashboard on the website, or I go over on the computer and show it to you. So uh, hopefully the next few days it'll be on the website. But you can hover over any date; it'll tell you the percent change uh, from last month to this month. Uh, it does uh, tell you that little spike that happened from uh, May to April. That monthly change from May to April 2020. I'm sorry, March to April 2020 was the largest monthly change in food prices since the 1970s. So, you know, it really shows up in this graph. Also, if somebody ever tells you, well, food prices always go up and they never come down, you can see that's not entirely true either. Um, although that, you know, generally uh, they tend to increase a little bit every year. They, they can come down and they do occasionally come down. Um, and then, you know, the most recent month, which is the one that journalists always want to talk about, so September to October is the most recent data we have, uh, you know, uh, uh, just that monthly change in all of food was almost a percentage point increase, which is a big, that's a big uh, increase you can see over on the right-hand side, sort of historically. Um, rather than month to month, you can calculate year over year. So compare this uh, October to the last October. Um, and so that, you know, similar thing, pick different food categories. It'll show you that this is more of an annual rate of change. So again, um, for the, the meat sector, which has been attracting a lot of, a lot of the attention, you know, that's a 10% annual rate of inflation if that kept up over time, which is you know, pretty astounding, um, but not totally unprecedented. Because you can see in the past, we have had some areas of time where we were in a similar ballpark most recently in you know, 2015 and 16. Um, or this is another question, like rather than, uh, you might want to pick a point in time, and say how much are how much higher are food prices today relative to that point in the past, and so this is like setting a base of January 1, 2010, and since that time, you know, overall all food prices at home were 23 percent higher today than they were, you know, roughly 10 years ago. Um, so, like a good basis of comparison here is you can drag that little bar to say, you know, March of uh, 2020, right before COVID hit, and say how much have food prices increased in total since this, this disruption happened? I'm, I'm mad, I don't get paid that bit more for the meat I produce now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, since 2020. I know, it's back to Mark's point. You want, you want more of that, that retail dollar. So like I said, this, these are 
uh, these are a lot of people that were involved in those dashboards that I mentioned, Renvir and Hope, the Diane helped with that first dashboard. Ahmad was really the driving force. Not only created the, I kind of gave him the idea for the food processing dashboard, and he like created the next three on his own. So that was really his driving. Anna uh, was the one really helping with this last food price dashboard. And we've got some money to help support some of these. And it's attracted a bunch of attention. So right now the chief economist office at USDA and the Economic Research Service both reached out to us and said, hey, can you keep doing some work like this? Um, and of course, we're grateful to have some funding by the, the Purdue Next Moves initiatives. So this is the last slide, but um, you know what's coming up next? Uh, I'd say the one frustration with the food price data is you saw October is the latest data we have. That's because that's the latest data the government has released. It'll be about... Um, you know, another three or four days, and we'll finally have data on November. So there's a real opportunity here to have more real-time price data or predictions. So Junho is working, you know, we're working together to see if we can't get better real-time data. Again, if you want to pay them, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, you can buy grocery store standard data. Um, and that's what the CPG companies do. But if you're just, you know, Joe Schmo, good luck. <laughs> you know? So one, you know, one thing I'd like to do is get these dashboards and maybe you'll have a little dotted line, which is what our prediction is for the next month based on more current data. Um, one thing we're working on now is uh, in addition to price changes, the government does track price levels, like what's the dollars per pound for a sirloin steak? The, the BLS does track that data. And um, can we converge that with other data and make other interesting calculations? So a blog post I did a month or two ago seemed to attract a bunch of attention that was, how many hours does the median worker have to work today to be able to buy a, a sirloin steak? So the time price of money, because it's, you know, if inflation is going up and your wages is going up, you're, you know, you're not necessarily worse off in terms of your buying power. And so um, again, just simple algebra, but there's interesting things I think you can learn by merging different data sets, and just doing a little bit of simple math to get insights people didn't have before. We are launching a monthly survey. Should we go out the door the first issue in January? We'll have one month every, uh, we'll do one every month after that. Focus on a variety of issues, consumers' perceptions of sustainability, affordability, food security. Uh, and we will probably create dashboards with that. Uh, Jen Ho is also working on a project to uh, eventually create some dashboards around social listening. Um, uh, Twitter, uh, social media conversations, sentiment about what are people thinking about beef, or about dairy, um, how, many, how much is that being talked about? Is it positive, is it negative? And again, making it that kind of data more publicly available. And I'll end with maybe one last comment or maybe encouragement, which is something I would have never thought of until the last couple of years. But uh, if I go back and look, um, you know, virtually all the academic papers I've ever published, I could have probably made a dashboard about that. I could have, you know, so it makes, it makes me think about the academic papers we produce. It's like a piece of art that you hang on a wall and it's nice and it's pretty, but it's sort of it's static, it's sort of sterile, it's a snapshot. And so, um, you know, how much more fun and, and exciting is it to say, here's the dashboard associated with my paper, uh, you know, and let the user mess around with the data a little bit. Um, I know uh, Nate's here, you know, often in economics now these days, you have to have a whole appendix of like 50 pages of all your robustness tests. So what if you added this variable that didn't do that? So, you know, I'm kind of envisioning maybe one day you just say, here's our dashboard, do it yourself if you want to see what happens, you know, when you do that. Um, but I think this is kind of a fun way to think about our data in the future rather than just these static artistic papers that we produce um, uh, rather let's do things that are dynamic and, and that allow people to interact with the research that we're doing. So I'll stop there. I didn't get any questions that I saw, at least from the, oh, it looks like there's several from the uh, chat, but happy to answer those would be out of time because Dennis is pulling out the cane, cane to pull me out here. So first of all, let's thank Jason for working. I'm supposing you're in the same position I am. Like this sparked more ideas of things that could be done than have been done. Yeah. So thank you for that. Just the creative thinking and the visualizations, uh, the layering of this and that. So uh, thanks very much for that. So we can do a little bit of Q&A if you need to go, certainly feel free to go. Would ask that if you have a question, you go ahead and use the microphone. It'll pick it up better on the Zoom. We'll keep Zoom open until We shut it off. <laughs>
So, but anyway, are there additional questions in the room? I can start there and then uh, we'll stop sharing the screen so we can go to gallery view and Zoom uh, if there are any questions there. Mark. Maybe I'll ask one while we wait, but uh, I guess your last comment made me think that uh, journal articles get read by I agree, and I, uh, this is a bias of mine, but some of my favorite extension outputs, I can see like the Center for Commercial Ag and my, our department, they have a, a crop basis forecasting tool. And it's a live interactive dashboard. And I've always been very partial to those kinds of extension and engagement products, rather than you go give a talk and you're, you're gone and it's done. You know, give, you know, empower people to make their own managerial decision making with, with with data and maybe help help you know nudge them, guide them through their ability to use the data. So I totally agree. I'd like us to see a lot more of that kind of stuff. The constraint historically, I think, has been you you'd have to go hire a computer programmer. And in fact, I think that's what CCA did when they had some funding to create their crop basis tool. But I think. Um, you know, it, at least as, if you're a smart guy, like say Ahmad, who's our postdoc, he had never used Power BI until about three months ago when he created those three dashboards. So, I mean, he's a smart guy. We, I think we teach good, you know, quantitative skills in economics, but it does show with very little training and sort of computer programming, you can create, a, you know, a dashboard that's, that's at least functional. If I may continue on this meta discussion about yeah. dashboards. Um, so, you know, we've had from 538, world and data now, there's a New York Times column, yeah. dashboards are the thing these days <laughs> when it comes to communicating data, but they're, they're, they're helpful. But I think the lesson that we learn from many of these is that they're useful ways for us to tell stories about data. That's true. Um, and I appreciate your note about, uh, you know, wanting us to, to share dashboards and make open access the data sets is ultimately a piece of this, um, which is something that we push in the academic field. So the phone just shows us you're working, shows your data itself. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about how you envision your work evolving to include open access to some of the derived products that you're creating, but then also allow for people to be able to deeply engage with the data, not just view it. So yeah. tell me a little about that narrative. So what one, say, functionality that's not in any of our dashboards, but I want to be there is there should be a button that says download the data. Right. And we, we don't have that. We haven't built that into any of ours yet, but I very much think it should be there when we can. Actually, one of those dashboards, the county level um, food processing, that's a proprietary data set. So we, we, we can, they'll, they will allow us to show the aggregates, but they won't allow us to do a downloadable data set. But any of the others I mentioned, yeah, totally, you could download them. We, or they, in theory, can be downloaded. Um, so I agree with that. The other thing that I think uh, of is, you know, when you think about data, all we're really doing, say that first dashboard on COVID, is we were taking data sets that already existed. But we just did a little bit of math, and in a way, we created new data because we were getting a lot of, uh, a lot. We got several emails from colleagues around the country that says, Hey, can I have your data on farm workers by county? And you know, my initial reaction was like, Well, you could just download these data and make the calculation. You know, but it was like we created new data by simply doing a little bit of algebra, which was kind of surprising to me. Um, so in those cases, because I didn't have that functionality, I just sent them the, the data sets, you know, that we that we had. So I, um, you know, we are uh, benefiting because Johns Hopkins has their cool website and they're making all their data publicly available on GitHub so we can go pull it every day. And so we wouldn't be able to do what we, we were doing on at least initial websites if they weren't doing what they were, they were doing. And I'm sure they had no idea that what they were doing would enable somebody like us to make the kind of cal calculations we are. So like in the same vein, I think if we can make our data available, we don't know how other people might use that too. So um, I'm very much a proponent of trying to think about when we can, as long as there aren't proprietary issues, trying to make, make these things uh, as, as, uh, you know, as publicly available as possible. I, I will say too, um, I'm, I don't want to spark a huge debate here, but you know, you can use these dashboards too, to maybe if, if you, didn't weren't as public minded, you could use them to maybe mislead a little bit. So, you know, the, this farmer share of the retail dollar, actually there, there is a website that has like a little dashboard of farmer share of the retail dollar for different commodities. In my view, 
that's a pretty poor indicator of farm profitability. There's a lot of reasons uh, you add value after the farm. It's not always taking away from the farmer. Uh, new packaging, new advertising, that you know, that super athlete that's on the Wheaties box, you know, all that stuff costs money, doesn't necessarily take away from the farmer. So you could create dashboards, but you could also, uh, I wouldn't say that that's not a misleading number, but you could use them to uh, promote causes <laughs> that, you know, maybe, uh, you know, would, wouldn't always be, uh, you know, what, what, what I would want them to be used for. But. Yeah. For the power of the commons is felt unequally. I think the question for me is, would your work, like, is there a particular audience that you are trying to empower? Who are you empowering? Yeah, that's yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's the question that Tom keeps asking. Like, who is your audience? Like, I don't know. We're just doing what we think is interesting right now. Um, uh, I mean, I think there's a lot of different audiences uh, to what we're trying to do. And so, some of that, frankly, uh, just to be honest, is media. So, you know, I am often getting questions from media. They're trying to understand the situation. And so I want to help them be able to tell their stories more effectively. Um, so in that sense, the audience is sort of the general consuming public interested in food. Then I'd say the other audience for me is sort of, you know, it's farmers and, and the agribusinesses involved here. And as, as they're thinking about vulnerabilities, where their problems may be, somebody mentioned the bad commodity groups. I mean, those are groups I engage with on a pretty regular basis. So those are certainly audiences for me as well. And trying to bring data to them they wouldn't have thought of or had access to before. Speaking to the audiences, I think part of this whole education of uh, this is more comment than question, but part of that education of what is the whole system that the gra the very nice agcom graphic that when animated is mm -hmm. very educational mm -hmm. uh, to the public. It's also educational to everyone along that chain who's involved. And I could see that some of these dashboards could be used essentially as a benchmark for my firm. Oh yeah. How am I compared to sort of what's typical in the country, in my county, in my state? And then it also helps them uncover like that the uh, Simpson index, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Like they could start doing some internal soul searching. Am I set up well or not well? Like use yeah. this primarily as education about how my business really works. Yeah. I mean, I think I agree. I think we do that to some extent at Purdue. So, uh, you know, I can log on to the data dashboards at Purdue. It's internal numbers, but I can say as a department head, I'm often looking uh, how many undergrad numbers do we have this year? What share of them were from Indiana? Because we're thinking about where do we need to recruit students? Um, what happened in the rest of the college? So I'm, I'm using our internal dashboards at Purdue on a you know, quasi monthly basis for you know, random questions. So totally, I mean, I totally agree. Um, and I, I, I do indeed, I, you know, in, in trying to hire some people for this new center, I had a, a one that, you know, a job that was in the creating these dashboards and several of the people, they were doing these internally for different companies uh, for their own internal uses. So uh, agree, I think that's sort of where the, the state of the art is uh, going forward. Actually, some of them had never created a dashboard that was publicly available. So they were like a little nervous about putting a <laughs> dashboard on a web page. <laughs> I was like, no, that's, that's what I want to do. So. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so one, I, I find it very interesting, um, kind of that you start out with a, a simple issue of vulnerability in terms of um, looking at COVID, and then now you're starting to build out kind of a suite of, of different uh, ways to look at this issue of vulnerability in the food system. Um, could you speak a little bit more about kind of the uh, social media project you guys are working on putting together? Um, how you plan to maybe collect that data? Because um, to me, even thinking about like Twitter or TikTok or Instagram or something, how do you gauge sentiments uh, from that and put that into um, a dashboard? Certainly, you're collecting data right now from like John Hopkins, but this is a completely different data issue that um, yeah. you're about to start tracking. I would say that effort is less about vulnerability, more about just trying to measure demand sure. changes. Um, and actually, I might defer here to Jin Ho because he's worked a little bit in this area, but you know, my understanding is. You know, one challenge here is you can create bots that will scrape any of these web pages. Um, of course, if Twitter sees that, they're going to kick you off. Um, so one of the ways they make money is by essentially allowing certain bots to troll their web pages and look for words and catchphrases. And so, uh, you know, I think Nicole Widmar in our department uh, has has bought access to one of those. Jen Ho's been working on those. I don't. Can you say anything about the? I know the sentiment, how that's 
done and calculated. It's not an area I'm an expert in. Uh, in the sentiment, well, basically, we're using um, the platform, which is called Netflix. You know, the contract with them because they have. Um, Can you use your microphone? Uh, oh, just cool. push the button. Hold it. Uh, I don't know. If not, just talk. I turned them down. I think it's working. Uh, so basically, we are we have a publisher contract with the, the platform company, which is called NetBase. Uh, because the thing is, um, just not just as Dr. Ross mentioned, you know, anybody can access to uh, computer data, right? They're coding and everything. So that platform has a contract with social media company like Twitter, Facebook, and everything, so that we can just have an access to their data thing, sort of thing. So that's why we have a contract, which is really expensive because they have a legal issues between them. Um, the, when it comes to sentiment, um, that platform has a category of positive in the word category of words that could be categorized into positive sentiment. For example, when it comes to COVID, um, lots of negative words, right? Um, that or other things. They have um, they have they have their own index for positive sentiment, negative sentiment, and net sentiment. So they calculate the net sentiment, uh, the relationship between positive and negative sentiment, and then they can get us um, that index uh, data so that we can just play a little bit with those positive sentiment index, negative sentiment index, and net sentiment index, which is not perfect at all, um, of course, because you know, when it comes to sarcastic words, you can, you know, easily categorize those words as positive or negative, but still, um, they're improving um, their way of categorizing those words, and then we can just get some help um, with them, get our own net sentiment for a specific issues, so that we can um, um, generate um, those sentiment data. So, this answer your question? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, I think one question we're sort of thinking is, well, what do we do with that data? Like, it's interesting. And you can imagine if you're in a brand or marketing in a company that that you're using that to measure effectiveness of a campaign. Let's say you did. Um, and so, a lot of the ag commodity organizations do commodity advertising, so they're interested in that from an ag, ag basis. Um, but, uh, you know, one example might be it's a little a little bit of a field here, but you know, there's a paper I think it was Nature or Science that some Scientists at Google published several years ago where they could they could predict flu cases before uh, you know ever the CDC or anybody had them by looking at search and and discussions you know online. So the, that's the thought here is how you know this might provide data that gives you some predictive ability in in you know very specific location or demographic that you wouldn't have had before. Um, in this case, I'm interested in. You know these data and how they might predict changes in certain food prices or food demand issues. So, like a big one for me now, I've been doing a bunch of work in the demand for plant based meat alternatives. I'm reading all these stories now about that apparently sales of plant based meat alternatives are falling um, relative to you know previous year. What's going on there? <laughs> you know, is that really happening? Is something weird happening in the supply chains, or is there really like a, a, a demand fall off? You know, like that, is that kind of data which could help us? understand like what are the drivers behind some of these things i think just in the interest of time we'll call it a close uh, but certainly you've sparked lots of thoughts jason so very much Good. appreciate it